get stuck in cycles of stress and anxiety at work based on our past experiences. Hello, I'm Chester Elton, and this is my dear friend and co-author, Adrian Gostick. Well, thank you, Chess. Our guest today promises to help break out of any stressful cycles we find ourselves in. As always, we hope the time you spend with us will help reduce the stigma of anxiety at work and in your personal life. And with us is our new friend, Chantel Donnelly, a physical therapist, wellness expert, and the author of the new book, Settled, How to Find Calm in a Stress-Inducing World. Welcome to the show, Chantel. We're delighted to have you here today. Thank you both. Oh, it's great to have you here, Chantel. Um, now, in your new book, you say that we've experienced at work over our working lives. Let me let me start that again, Brett. It's great to have you here, Chantel. Um, you say that what we've experienced at work over our working lives is affecting how we interpret our current workday. Makes sense. But we need to break that pattern and rewrite our narrative about work. And that requires some techniques that allow the body to feel safe and supported. Love that. So walk us through this idea. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here. <laughs> Have either of you seen the television series Severance? I, I saw the first episode. <laughs> I didn't like it very much. So, And it kind of confused me. But go ahead. Explain to our, our listeners. Yeah. They, they probably are, are more worldly than we are. Yeah. yeah I, I, there's this guy at work. But then he, when he's not at work, he can't remember anything that he did at work. Is that the deal? Okay. Exactly. So it's about, a, obviously, a fictional corporation that creates. Oh, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that. Okay, good. Yeah, I've yeah, seen that. So show. they right. create this very dystopian um, story around this company that that severs, separates a, a worker's work memory from their home memory, from their non-work memory. And, you know, it's an interesting premise in that we all know how much our home life, our home stressors, um, you know, what happened with your spouse before you left the house, what happened on the way in the traffic, your financial strain, the email you got before you got to work, all of that stuff is going to affect your work. So in this in this crazy uh, TV series, the employee gets in the uh, elevator to go to work and all of his memory of who he is outside of work goes away and all he remembers is who he is at work. He remembers his colleagues, he remembers how to do his work, but he doesn't remember all of his other troubles that he has at home or his good stuff that he has at home too, right? And of course, the writers don't have to explain why a company would want to do this. I think we all kind of intuitively know that, oh yeah, okay. Um, but what happens is this company discovers that what happens at work is also going to, we're human, we're not robots, right? So what happens at work and unfolds there is going to either be distracting or is going to be stressful and is going to have an impact on us. So it's, it's an interesting story based on, you know, trying to change human nature and how it just doesn't really work and backfires. So on that note, based on your question, I'm going to tell you a, a true story now. Um, we're, we're going to call this guy Max. So Max was working for a company and had a boss who sort of was gaslighting him a little bit and was um, disrespectful towards him in front of his colleagues. And it usually happened around the meeting table, around the boardroom table. And he ends up having to take a leave of absence due to anxiety because of this interaction with his boss. And eventually he gets help and he heals. And when he goes back to the same company, they put him in a different area, different floor, different boss, different everything. Uh, and he has his first board meeting and the new boss who is really lovely and very respectful, uh, total, you know, 180 from the old boss. They're sitting around the boardroom table and he introduces him. He introduces Max to all the new employees and or all of his new colleagues, I should say. And Max has a panic attack. Because the way the brain works is if the brain is sensing something from our external environment, its job is to predict what is happening. And because Max was sitting in a very similar environment 
where there was some hierarchy, there was a boss involved, a leader, his brain predicted that he was going to be bullied, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's that predicting brain that can carry us through. So if we have left a difficult situation in a job and have moved on to something new, we may not know it. It may be subconscious, but it may be affecting the way that we are currently interacting in a better position, a better situation, but we're not seeing it that way. So Max actually thought that his boss was attacking him, this new boss, and he wasn't, of course. Right. And it's it's about resetting that um, miscommunication between the body and the brain and this this sensation of going into the past with those predictions. Um, If you put someone with PTSD into an MRI machine and you look at what's happening with their brain as they're hearing the story of what caused their PTSD, The brain is interpreting it in an area where it only knows the present. So the brain is interpreting the story as if it's happening right now. It doesn't distinguish that it happened in the past. And so healing occurs with sort of a realignment with this knowledge that what's happening in the body is happening in the present moment, not in the past. So let me ask you, so uh, how did he get over that? I mean, it's a real story, so you've got a connection with Max. So what, did he have to change buildings or, <laughs> you know, no. no more boardroom, you know, conversation? How did he do the reset? It is a really good question, Chester. And here's what he did. He spoke to his body. He learned his body's language. Because we often think about mindset, right? We're, we're a society that really prioritizes everything in our mind. And we think that that's what makes us so special, but really stress is in the body. Anxiety is in the body. And so we taught Max how to listen to his body and be able to talk in his body's language. So the way he did that was while he was at the, the same boardroom table where the panic attack was happening with the new boss, He would use his breath. He would feel the chair that he was sitting on on his skin to bring him some mindfulness type activities. And then what we know is that doing cross body tactile stimulation also resets the nervous system. So under the table, nobody could see him doing this. He crossed his arms and placed them on his legs. And he did little taps, right side, left side, right leg, left leg. And we know that those types of movements are really good for building resilience and helping someone calm their nervous system. You know, it really is interesting, isn't it? How how having those techniques, having those go-to things can really save you in situations, you know? Mm -hmm. And isn't it interesting how often it comes back to your breathing? Making sure you get enough oxygen to your brain, you know, because we tend to stop breathing in in intense situations. That, this the tapping and whatnot, and your body's language is is, is really fascinating. Well, t- tell me about some of the surprising things that can happen at work that can throw you off. You talk a little bit about that, and how can we deal with that? And what have you found as a physical therapist? What what are some keys there when when you're surprised? Like he was going into the meeting, he was anticipating that during the day something surprising comes up. How do you deal with that? It, you know, there's a lot of little things that happen in a regular workday that actually add to the stress of the workday that, that if we can manage those things, we'll be able to manage the other stressors better. And they are rather surprising. You mentioned breathing, which was, is absolutely right on track. Um, so there's two things that most employees, not everybody, because some people have some very um, physical jobs, but most employees two things that we do on a daily basis that really impact our nervous systems. Number one is sitting. And number two is focusing. We really focus whether we're in a meeting, we're really focusing on what someone is saying, or if we're on a screen reading email or what have you, right? Where there's that narrowed focus with our eyes that happens when we are in a work situation. So the, the, the two things, so let's start with the narrow focus. So when we are in a fight flight 
mode, right? That sympathetic nervous system, going back to biology 101. Um, what happens naturally, and this is, this is a good thing because if we're in a true emergency, we want this to happen, is our visual field will focus. It narrows, okay? And that's a, one way that, we know, that our body knows that we are in an emergency. So if we're doing that, all day at work, we've now sent a message that we are constantly in emergency mode. So if we're in survival mode, right, it just puts us right into that stress response. And um, that's going to be problematic, even though we don't know that that's what's going on. Okay, so sitting was the other one that I talked about. And Chester, you had mentioned breathing earlier. When we sit, we tend to slouch. I'm a physical therapist. (laughs) It, it's, it's not a, a, a function of you being a bad person. We all tend to slouch. We're not really designed to sit as much as we do. So there's a couple of things that happen when you're sitting. Number one, you compress your, your, your diaphragm and your rib cage, and that is going to limit how large of a breath you can take. So it is going to decrease your, uh, your capacity to breathe properly, okay? The other thing that it does is it tightens up something called your psoas muscle. So that's a hip flexor. So when we are sitting, we are in hip flexion. And this muscle that attaches um, from our spine to our, our, our leg bone tightens up. It's just in a shortened position. Well, that muscle happens to have connections with our diaphragm. And so it is going to also affect our breathing. Okay. It's also the muscle that allows us to run away. So fight, flight, we're flighting, right? So it's sort of like half contracted during our workday as, and, and can you know, erroneously send us into this flight pattern, this need to escape. Okay. The other thing with sitting is that our mid-back, our, the, the mid-back, it's called your, your thoracic spine, that is where our sympathetic nervous system lives. That's where our fight flight system is housed. Okay. And that area gets tight. I have a theory and my theory is that the reason we get all get so lethargic around three o'clock in the afternoon is because that area has tightened up so much throughout the day that our energy levels, which are part of our, our fight flight system are sort of in freeze. They're, they're stuck. And, um, that's going to sort of put us in this sort of like collapsed, sort of lethargic fatigue sort of a a situation. So those are the two things, focus and sitting. And we can change those two things. We can alter those things throughout the day. And that's going to help us decrease our stress at work. Yeah, this is really fascinating. I love how you're bringing physiology into this as well as psychology. This is this is terrific. Okay, so one of the things that you and you're writing, you're very honest. I love that when when an author is vulnerable and you talk about how you used to handle stress by toggling between overcompensating and then shutting down. And I'm sure there's more than one person, you know, nodding, saying, "Boy, I've been there, done that." So how do how did you personally learn to manage your stress a little better? Yes, thank you. I was vulnerable. (laughs) Um, First thing I'm going to say is that's totally normal if that's something that your listeners are going through. Um, I don't want to pathologize being under stress because it is absolutely what your body and your biology wants you to do. The problem is that we tend to get stuck in uh, a defensive stress response. So what happened with me is that I would toggle, I was... Um, hypervigilant, uh, type A personality, you know, um, just really high performing. And then I would go into this sort of hopeless, shut down, paralyzed situation. And I never really found a happy middle. I had these stress extremes that I would bounce back and forth from and never really settled into what I call in the book, your settled section. And the settled section is not necessarily calm. It's not this super zen, blissed out place. Because especially at work, like I said, we need a little bit of that sympathetic energy. So settled section is calm yet energized. I'm connected with myself and with others. But I'm also got some drive and motivation. I have a little bit of what scientists call sympathetic arousal. 
right? Just a little bit of that, that energy to get you through the workday. You know, I need it right now to be on a podcast, for example. Otherwise, I would be boring, you guys. I would be, you know, too blissed out and a little bit spacey and, and you know, um, it, it we, just, we've had that guest. Yeah. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that guest. yeah, it just helps you focus. It helps you um, stay with your intentions and have a little bit of drive. Excellent. Excellent. You know, it's interesting. You talk about connecting with your deeper self and how that is, is really helpful, right? That we can build stronger relationships with others. So uh, how does that work? How do we connect with our our deeper self as we sit here narrowly focused on our screens <laughs> with, with better posture than I've had in a while, by the way, yeah, that's about sitting up straight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When we connect with ourselves, what that means is that we are connecting with our bodies. Scientists call it your interoception. Your interoception is your sense and awareness of your body's internal sensations. I call it your soul speak. When you are in touch with what's going on inside of your body, you, when you interact with others, it be there, there's more clarity. So when I interact with somebody else, if I'm in a state of, let's say fight or flight again. Okay. So I'm feeling agitated. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling either hyper-focused or under-focused. I'm feeling like I want to blame people generally is what happens. I have a lot of shoulds on my list of things to do, and I'm feeling rather frantic, okay? Now, if I have an interaction with a work colleague while I'm feeling that way, and I'm not aware of where I am in my nervous system state, what happens is that person, whatever they say to me, benign comment or not, I am probably going to take it personally, and feel like I am being told off or chastised or disrespected or whatever it is, right? And so that's going to cause problems. I call this the barometer or brat situation. Is my colleague being a brat or is my colleague a barometer for where I am in my nervous system currently? And so that connection really can build the more you know about yourself and your own stress and how you express that stress and where you are right now and having some some self-compassion for yourself because again we don't want to pathologize being there and it that's what's going to help you find your settled section because as soon as you start to understand your soul speak you can then talk to your body and and allow it to feel supported and safe and that's going to allow you to have more bandwidth for the stressors that are being thrown at you it's a terrific term. Yeah, your soul speak. Yeah, are we are we in touch with our deeper selves? People are going to be wondering how they can uh, learn more about your good work, Chantal. Where would you send them? I have a company called Body Insight, and so my my website is bodyinsight.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram. I have a lot of videos with lots and lots of tools. Um, so that is at Body Insight Inc. INC, Body Insight Inc. on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and if you go to my website, you can sign up for my newsletter and you'll find out about all the workshops I'm doing, book events I'm doing. And then, of course, they can order my book anywhere books are sold. It's called Settled, How to Find Calm in a Stress-Inducing World. Which is something we all need. So uh, we're, I notice our time is running low. It, this has flown by. Give us a, one or two more little specific practices maybe we can use to, to send us off today. Yeah, well, let's go back to the focus and sitting. So if you're at work and you find that your eyes are getting tired and that you've really been focusing in that narrow tunnel vision that I was talking about earlier, I highly recommend going to a window and looking at the horizon. So when we take in a sunset, I my theory is that it's not just the beauty of nature because there is that component that helps us calm our nervous system, but it's also that softening of the eyes and that opening up your peripheral vision that really helps. I recommend leaders have pictures of sunsets or, or some sort of a horizon that employees can go and walk to and, and kind of take in um, to kind of open up their vision and allow their eyes to soften 
and widen that focus every once in a while. The getting up is really important too, because now we're going to be moving our body and getting out of a seated position. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but dehydration causes stress in your body, and you may not realize you're dehydrated, but that can activate your immune system, which will activate your sympathetic nervous system. So just get up and go drink more water during the day is one really great way to get out of that sitting position. And then there's something I call undulate to regulate. You're going to undulate your spine. So that mid back where your sympathetic nervous system lives, you can do side stretches. You can do sort of cat cow, if you know what that is, sort of a rounding and arching of the middle back spine. Um, and rotations. You'll see a lot of people doing rotations naturally at a, at a, sitting at their chairs, right? They'll kind of twist their body from right to left. Those people are actually trying to calm their nervous systems down and stretch at the same time. They just don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, give us one personal practice that you do. Uh, you've given all these recommendations. What's the one thing you make sure you do every day to, to keep your mind and, and body straight? I, I do some breathing practices, um, you know, besides going to bed early and that kind of thing, the, the, the nervous system tools that I use, I'll give you one. Um, people don't really understand how breathing works, but when you inhale, your heart rate goes up a little. And when you exhale, your heart rate goes down a little. So we can speak to our bodies by lengthening our exhalation, and that's going to calm our heart rate down slow it down. So what I do is a, a three counts in and in, on my inhale, and then I do six counts on the exhale. And that is just a reset for me to allow my body to know that everything's okay, everything's safe. And that sends a message up to the brain that, hey, this is a good day. That's great. Hey, That's our awesome. guest has been Chantelle Donnelly. She is the author of the new book, Settled, How to Find Calm in a Stress-Inducing World. It's been a delight to have you here. Follow her on Instagram, find her on Facebook, buy her book, and look for events and workshops in a town near you. Chantelle, thank you so much for your time today. This has been delightful and instructive and really helpful. Thank you. Thank you both. Well, just, just a really practical uh, thoughtful uh, guest today. Chantal gave us lots of really interesting uh, kind of things to think about our bodies and how that affects our stress and anxiety. So, so what are you taking away? Well, first and foremost, you know, we always talk about your mental, you know, practices and so on. She said, look, get physical and, uh, you know, make sure that you're stretching, make sure you're getting up, make sure you're looking out the window at horizons and, and, and rotating and so on. I thought it was really good to connect. You know, we often say, look, get up and go for a walk. Well, why do we do that? Because it's physical and it changes, uh, it changes our posture. That was my first big takeaway. Don't forget the physical part. Focus Absolutely. on the mental part. Don't forget the physical part. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, and part of that, and I, and I like what she was saying, that the, how the physical comes into this while, you know, you're sitting in a meeting, and I loved her thought of the predicting brain. Right. Um, because that, that is anxiety, right? We're worrying about the future. And we're also thinking that the past will replicate itself. That's what, that's what happens here. And so we're her example of this, uh, you know, uh, generic person who is real <laughs> is that, uh, you know, he learned to get in touch with his body, you know, use his breath, you know, do the, do the right, left, left leg tap, feel, you know, something around you, touch, um, things like touch, breathing, etc. bring us back to the present. And that's how we fight anxiety. You know, that, that's really powerful in uh, using the body to fight the predictive brain. Yeah. Talk, talk in your body's language. I thought that was really an interesting insight. You know, get to know your body and talk to your body so that your body responds in the language that it knows, um, that we can get stuck in a defensive mode. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. And, and again, back to the story of Max, that the boardroom was, you know, was stressful. Was the trigger. Yeah, yeah even, even though the new boss was gracious and lovely and was doing all the yeah. right things, it's the boardroom. Bad things happen. In the boardroom, right? Yeah, yeah. No, so and a couple of things, you know, for all of us who sit at uh, our desks all day or at computers all day is that, you know, sitting impacts our nervous system. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, we breathe less and less as the day goes on. Our backs get tighter and tighter. But also as we focus, and now we're doing so much Zoom or Teams or Skype, is that we're focusing so narrowly on this one little idea, uh, this little image in front of us, 
and focusing usually for our bodies says that we're we're about to do a, a survival mode something important is happening and when that happens all day long so just simple things she's saying right get up uh, stretch move but also look to the horizon shake things up it will help decrease your anxiety levels very practical very very important yeah breathe move hydrate <laughs> you know breathe yeah, move hydrate yeah, uh, good yeah. stuff well, she's been great, and uh, you know we're grateful for all our wonderful guests and the books they write and the, the knowledge they share with us. Again, her, her book is Settled, How to Find Calm in a Stress-Inducing World. She was a delightful guest, and, and you know we're always grateful and, and give special thanks to our wonderful producer, Brent Klein, and to Christy Lawrence, who helps us find amazing guests, and of course to all of you who listen, and we're always appreciative that you find the time. If you like the podcast, please share it. Uh, we'd like you also, to also have you come visit our our website, thecultureworks.com, for free resources and how you can get some tips and, and ideas on how to help you and your team thrive. And we love speaking to audiences around the world, virtually or in person, on the topics of culture, teamwork, resilience. Give us a call. We'd love to talk to you about your event. Um, also, pick up a copy of that best-selling book, Anxiety at Work. And that will help you more than anything. Right, Chess? Absolutely. And share that with a friend. Well, listen, this has been a delight to be with you. Uh, look forward to the next episode and being with you again, Adrian. But until then, as you always say, what is it that you always say? We wish you the best of mental health. <laughs>